Oh, hi. I'm Dave Knowlton, and this talk is going to be on the topic of art as process. Art is process. But before we get to the topic, a little bit about me, so that you will know the perspective from which a lot of this talk is coming. I am a writer, mostly nonfiction, uh, though a little bit of poetry. I also am a performing arts educator. I have produced and directed. I am a choreographer, a music composer and arranger, and an adjudicator and juror for a wide variety of arts, mostly performing arts, events. And over the years, I have had the pleasure of teaching some wonderful young people, hundreds if not perhaps thousands of wonderful young people through the performing arts. I am a board member at the Jacoby Arts Center in Alton, Illinois. Please check us out at www.jacobyartscenter.org. I am also the co-host of the Learning Vibes podcast, learningvibespodcast.weebly.com. And I am a professor and graduate program director of instructional technology at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. And instructional technology certainly is based in process, if not artistic process. You can find information about the instructional technology program at www.siue.edu slash instructional technology. Okay. Art is process, but so what? Why should you care? This talk is a variation on a keynote address that I gave last summer, in summer of 2019, at the Jacoby Arts Center as part of their Artists in the Spotlight series. And I think as we start contemplating art is process, art as process, you should realize that this doesn't apply just to the arts. Whether you are an engineer, an, ed a, an, an economist, a business person, an educator, a student, an entrepreneur, I argue that the most successful people take a process approach to their work and that we have quite a lot to learn from artists as we consider the nature of that process. You know, professionally, process has been something important to me for a long time, but it also has a personal significance. To help you understand a little bit about my perspective on process, I would like to share with you a conversation that I had with a friend and mentor of mine, Keith Baker. Keith is an artist in his own right and a brilliant historian of medieval history, church history, and a very, he is a very careful student of politics, culture, religion, and so forth. And about a decade ago, I said to him, Keith, 
I am so jealous of your expertise. You know a lot of stuff. And I just don't have deep expertise in information like you do. I am jealous. And his response was, but of course you have expertise. It's just not expertise in stuff. It is expertise in process. That was a real pivotal moment for me for two contradictory reasons. First, as this was coming out of his mouth, I realized it was a statement of the obvious. I am an expert in process. But second, as he said it, it was a real revelation for me and changed me to where I have even more so embraced the importance, uh, dare I say, the spiritual significance of work through process. You will hear a lot more in this presentation about the way people like Keith have influenced me. One of the first implications of process is surround yourself with brilliant people. Most of what I'm about to share with you comes from two very good books. One by Michael Pepiat called Interviews with Artists. The other by Anne McCutcheon called The Muse That Sings. Both books essentially are divided into chapters with, in Pepiat's case, painters, sculptors, textile people, architects, and in McCutcheon's case, music composers about their creative processes, how they do what they do. And a lot of what I'm about to share comes from these books. Look, there is no one way to talk about the artistic process. And any attempt to represent the artistic process will be inherently flawed and a huge abstraction. But represent it is what I am going to try to do here. And I think regardless of how you think about the artistic process, we have to start with the idea of inspiration, right? I mean, these blessed artists simply are visited by the gods and the muse, and wonderful ideas fully formed are handed down to them that they then seamlessly and without effort bring forth into the world to bless those of us who are not artistically blessed inspiration, right? <laughs> it's poppycock. Inspiration is for amateurs. I love the way music composer Steve Reich says it. Check out this quote. working away until something begins to catch fire. That's what we really know about the start of the artistic process. It doesn't start with generating, it uh, with inspiration rather. It starts with generating. The brilliant author Anne Lamott 
says it this way, and I share this quote with all of my students. childlike, something you can't get at through more rational, grown-up means. Just get it all out there and play with it. That's really what Lamont is saying. It begins with play. And only after you get it out there can you continue the artistic process of revising and rethinking. And really, this is an act of discovery. You are trying as an artist or a business person or student or entrepreneur to figure out what it is that you have to say that has meaning and value to it. I have an idea of what I would like to do, but as I start working, as I start generating, that evaporates and something else will start to crystallize. I think what artist Francis Bacon is talking about here is this process from generating to revising and rethinking to regenerating until something else starts to crystallize. What Steve Reich said in his earlier quote about something starting to catch fire. and until they catch fire, they are unforeseen. Until they catch fire, the thrill, dare we say the inspiration is not there. You know, I have a very personal lesson early in my life on this process. My great aunt Emma was an artist in the Mississippi Delta, certainly of regional uh, positive acclaim, if not national positive acclaim. In fact, if you like art, please check out her retrospective website, MississippiEmma.com. If it doesn't come up right away, search Emma Knowlton Lytle. And the lesson from her on this process that I learned came as a small child. I would guess I was certainly younger than five, three or four years old. And she created a bust of me. And I have a memory, whether they are real memories or reconstructed memories, I guess I can't say, but I remember the smell of the studio behind her house. And I remember her asking me to sit very, very still, an impossibility for a young child. As she went back and forth, between running her hands down the side of my face, 
feeling the structure of my cheekbones and jawline, and then moving her hands to the clay and molding and shaping. And then her hands back to the curvature of my ears over the top of my head and back to the clay. A process of using touch to generate, then revise and rethink and generate some more to discover what it is that she had to say in terms of creating this piece of art that was both a representation of me, but was infused with meaning because she brought it to fruition through her own learning process. A very important lesson for me about generating, revising, and rethinking as an act of discovery for the artist. And I think it, it is an, an important process, this process of discovery for everyone as they create and work. Sooner or later, you do have to put your work in front of an audience. I have always loved putting products that I have been involved in in front of an audience. This is me in 1985 in a performance with the Briarcrest Band from Eads, Tennessee. And that organization was essential to my growth and development as an audience, as an artist, and understanding what it means to evoke a response from an audience. Even as a university student, I continued to love the process of putting products in front of an audience. Audience, audience, know your audience. It is essential for whatever it is that you do. What you're there for is to please the people. It is an, an extreme view pleasing the people is, particularly for artists. And perhaps it goes a little too far. But I sure think artists need to be very aware, particularly modern artists, need to be very aware of the opposite. Henry Geldzoller was a curator, art critic, and historian of international acclaim. And I think he was right. I find that a lot of modern art has become, frankly, self-indulgent nonsense. And I argue that certainly it is not always the role in the artistic process to please the audience, but as soon as we open the doors of our galleries, of our performance studios, of our auditoriums, we have a responsibility to our audience. And I think we artists and all who do meaningful work that involves process make a huge mistake to not in some way evoke 
meaningful responses to our from our audiences by having something meaningful to say to them. It's very important. And audience centeredness, whether you are a business person, a student, an entrepreneur, or a writer, or some other type of artist, is essential. Notice that editing comes very late in the process. So the early processes of generating, revising, and rethinking, these are the mysterious, the intuitive. Now as we get to editing, we are thinking about the intellectual and the technical. It's one reason that writers have writer's block, by the way. They start the process by thinking about grammar, mechanics, punctuation, spelling, the intellectual and the technical. That's too early. Uh, to, to think about those things should come at the editing stage of the process. It is here in editing that we start bringing in the technical and balancing it with the imagination. Here we see that editing does occur after we get feedback from audiences. You know, as a performer, I loved practices more than I loved performances. Here I am in 1985, and I'm delighted that you can't get a better view of the hair. It was the flock of seagulls age, I will remind you. And even when I got to college, a dress rehearsal meant the world to me. One thing I love about this photo and that makes it so meaningful to me is that this is my best friend to this day, Dr. David Sharp, my best friend since 1992, and certainly and an important part of the artistic process is relationship with others. I talked earlier about Keith Baker, now about Dr. Sharp people and involving people, that close circle and network, or sometimes that loose circle and network is so important. But I digress. The editing, the rehearsal process, the, the technical process of now that we have audience feedback, what's the next step? Then more critique and review. And certainly I agree with this composer that we want the critique and review of trained professionals, of subject matter experts, if you will, but don't overlook intuitive critiques and reviews. Now, I don't know if O'Donohue's wife was an artist or not, but I am inferring from this quote that getting a distant review, a non-subject matter expert review, someone who can come and see it with fresh eyes and maybe without even subject matter expertise is powerful and important to the process. 
I am quoting Benjamin Franklin very loosely here, but he said something like this. So that involvement of people, of your close personal network. For me, in addition to people like Mr. Baker, Dr. Sharp, it is my family. This is the only picture I have of my family with all of them in the dance studio. It's a couple of years old, if not four years old. But my daughter, Sarah, that you see up front here, she is great at critique and review of my language, of my attempts at humor, of the way I'm planning to say something to an audience, particularly with humor. She will either openly announce, that was funny, or she will hold up the hand and say, no, dad, just stop. My wife, Heather, in the middle here, is a brilliant writer and editor, in addition to being a dancer. And she doesn't hold back with her red pen. The number of times I've given her a manuscript that I thought was ready to ship out or asked her to listen to a piece of music or consider one of my visual ideas that I thought was done, and she just bleeds all over it with a red pen. She can hurt a man's self-esteem with that red pen. But you know what? Even though she leads me back to editing, thinking about my audience, revising and rethinking, generating and going through that loop endlessly, her brutal critique and review always makes the work better. My daughter, Emma, in the back, is a dance major now at Southeast Missouri State University. She is a brilliant choreographer. I ask her to listen to many of my musical arrangements and rough draft sketches of musical pieces so that she can filter it through the lens of movement and visual design. She is not a musician. She was in band for one year. But she can bring her expertise to the process of critique and review. It is essential to the process, the artistic process, and iteratively making it work. Finally, we have deadlines. I heard the brilliant author John Grisham say this on the Today Show years ago. I immediately jotted it down as quickly as I could to capture his exact words. I love this idea that Harrison offers. Setting preliminary deadlines so that the real deadlines do not sneak up on you. I regularly argue with my students and with other artists in my life, last minute is not a style. It is sloth. Procrastination is not a style. It is poor planning. So as a piece of practical advice, I urge people to set their own deadlines prior to the actual deadlines so that they have time to continue going through this loop to make their work better and better. 
I take this process, the artistic process, so seriously, both in my work as an artist, but, but also in my work as a business professional, as a professor, in my entrepreneurial consulting. For years, this picture that you were looking at was the wallpaper on my iPad, my work computer, and my phone. It is something I believe in so strongly and practice. In my work as a writer, for instance, we can see this process. I write at the computer. I revise and, and rethink and generate at the computer. <clears throat> I cannot edit at the computer. I print out my work and mark on it with a pen and then type in changes. A few years ago, I wrote a 34 page manuscript, was the final draft at the deadline. So imagine the thickness of a 34 page manuscript. But I decided I was going to keep all of my drafts that I printed out for editing. I trusted the process. And to produce at the final deadline that 34 page manuscript, I went through 27 drafts of that manuscript. It is a process of anguish. I can so relate to the quote from Blake here. I never have achieved what I try to achieve. In all of my work, I can think of a small handful of projects, less than five, where I thought, you know what? The anguish and process that I went through actually resulted in fulfilling my vision. It achieved what I wanted to achieve. It is so rare for that to happen. It is a process of anguish, and it is a process that often does not lead to a realized final product. I wonder, have these ideas on process given you any thoughts of your own? Questions that you have? Notes that have implications for your own work? Uh, disconnects between what I have said and your own work? Consider briefly pausing this video and jotting down some of your own thoughts, reactions, questions, and ideas about process. And once you have done that, then resume this video. You know, there are a few more things we can say about process. One of my best friends and closest confidants in this world, Elaine Smith, shared with me as I was preparing this talk for the Jacoby Arts Center, a quote that is important to her. And part of the quote reads like this. And I must confess, this quote rubbed against my background in a lot of ways. Growing up in Southern culture in particular, where it was all about 
in my upbringing positive, tangible results. The bottom line, the end product, that to be told that whether or not I succeed is irrelevant. And in fact, there is no such thing as success. Oh, this was hard to take as I think about the process of my work. But one thing, as I kept thinking about this quote that Elaine shared with me, is that in some ways it depends on how you define success. Let's look at the next part of this quote. And here is what I think is the magic, the secret sauce, if you will, that when we take process seriously, we bring out in ourselves the unknown. It is not just a process of learning about our products our content, and our work, but it is a process of bringing ourselves and learning about ourselves to our work. And I think for great artists like Elaine, who is a great artist in her own right, like Keith Baker, who I talked about earlier, like a lot of the people I have quoted in this slideshow, there is a self-discovery component that is so essential and so important to what it is that we do. Who said this quote, actually? The brilliant artist, Georgia O'Keeffe said it. Making your unknown known, that is the important thing. And it does require process and skill to do so. I love the way the brilliant Twyla Tharp said it. This comes from Twyla Tharp's book, The Creative Habit, and I strongly recommend it. It is developed through exercise, through repetition, through a blend of learning and reflection. In other words, through process. And it is painstaking and rewarding. Talk about painstaking and rewarding. at the expanding edge of our consciousness, pressing into the unknown. That is scary. That is uncomfortable. But that's also where the magic happens. That's where we make our unknown known. And that is what makes life lovely and lively. As you think about this presentation, I hope it has raised questions for you, thoughts for you, disagreements with what it is I have to say. Consider pausing this video and jotting some of those things down. 
but also consider sharing those ideas with me. I hope you will reach out to me and share some of your reactions to this talk. And I hope the last 40 minutes have been a good use of your time.